Oh. oh, the countdown didn't happen. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> We are now live. Usually we have a bit of a countdown, but I think that I forgot to play the animation. So we're just right jumping into it. You'll see all of our presenters here on screen and I'm just gonna wait for a little while for folks to join. I'm just gonna remove folks from the screen for now and just leave myself and my other facilitator Nithya on the screen to welcome people as they arrive. We'll give it about a minute to let people settle in to space. If you're uh, calling in either from Facebook or YouTube, you can use the chat function to participate in this talk today. So as you arrive, maybe you can share where you're calling in from, whose ancestral territory you might be on right now. Um, it's always fun to hear where uh, we're reaching out to when we start these webinars. And as we move through the presentation today, the chat function can be your best friend. You can enter any questions that come up there. I'll be collecting them for you to pose to our speakers as the presentations go on. Let's just give it a few more seconds here. We've got a pretty jam packed schedule. So we'll wanna get going pretty quickly to allow a lot of discussion at the end of our session. If you're just joining us, feel free to use the chat box to let us know where you're calling in from. All right. Well, we've got some folks in the audience I can see. Um, so feel free to use that chat as you come in, but I'm going to hand the mic over to Nithya from Coexisting with Carnivores to get us started. Thanks, Shauna. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Project Teach, talking about ecology and aims for conserving habitat. My name is Nithya Chari Harris, and I'm a director of the Coexisting with Carnivores Alliance. I'm joined today by our panel of three experts who I will introduce shortly, and of course, Shauna Dahl, Gulf Islands Forest Project Coordinator with Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, who with others have done a tremendous job of pulling this, all this together. I will be facilitating today's discussion. Today's topic is connecting over carnivores, the role of carnivores in maintaining climate stability in coastal BC. We wish to express our gratitude and appreciation to be here on the unceded territories of the South Nation and of the neighboring Pachidat and Sianu Nations and of the Songhees, Esquimalt and the Huasanich Nations. I would also like to recognize that dozens of distinct Coast Salish and Nuchalnut nations on whose territories most of us are in attendance today. Also, it is important at this time to give our gratitude and appreciation to the land, the waters, and the air, and all the diverse life within them that form the unique ecosystems that sustain our lives. We welcome you to make your own land acknowledgments in the chat box. Shauna? So audience members are tuning in today using either Facebook or YouTube. And like I said at the beginning of the presentation, you can participate by entering any questions you might have into the chat on either platform. I'll be monitoring the chats throughout the presentations and I'll collect questions to pose to each expert at the end of their presentation. There'll only be time for one or two questions before we move on to the next presenter, but we have time scheduled at the end of their presentations so we can have a more robust discussion. So if we don't get to your question right away, don't worry, there's should be ample time at the end of the session um, to discuss those questions. And with that, we will turn things over to our first presenter. Thanks, Shana. So Dr. Chris Deramont is a professor, provost, engaged scholar, and, a rain, and the Rain Coast Chair of Applied Conservation Science Lab in the Department of Geography at the University of Victoria. Chris earned a PhD in ecology and evolution from the biology department at UVic and completed a postdoc at the University of California, Santa Cruz. As an interdisciplinary researcher, Chris has been influenced by a broad network of mentors and collaborators, including colleagues, friends, and knowledge holders, among them the, ha the Haosuk, the Wukina, the Kilisu Hai Hai, and the Newhawk Nations. Chris has had a long-term affiliation with the science-based ENGO, Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, and was an important mentor in the founding of the Coexisting with Carnivores Alliance. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Nitya. Thank you, everyone. I'm honored to be here. I'm coming to you from the territories of the Wasainich, specifically the Sayout people. 
Also, uh, my office here at UVic is in the territories of Lekwungen peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt. My entrance point to think about climate stability and carnivores uh, is thinking about the relationships that people have with these animals across the landscape. I'm going to advance my slides here and hopefully this works. There we go. The a point I want to make early on, if you only understand one thing from this presentation is that we cannot understand the relationship, say, for example, between predator and prey without understanding the broader relationships that co-evolved with these other animals. And what I mean by that is the participation of humans in the ecologies of these landscapes since time immemorial. Uh, people like my my colleague, my sister, Jess Hausty of the Heisuk people, Heltsuk people of Bella Bella, remind me that uh, relationships between people and place are uh, enduring, are strong. Likewise, relationships between people and animals are more than what uh, people with my training or my background culturally and otherwise would tend to think of them. For example, in Heltsuk cultures and, and, and others, Animals like the grizzly bear are considered uh, kin, ancestors, etc. And this sets in motion a very different relationship and a way of stewarding an ecosystem that treats animals like this as relatives. So I've organized this, this short talk under three sort of buckets, and it's a way of thinking about how you would take care of any relative about which you cared. You'd want to make sure they have a meal. You want to make sure they're well fed. You want to make sure that they're secure, that their safety is, is um, forefront in your mind. And even if they're well fed and they're, they're safe in other um, ways, do they have a home? And this is where we talk about habitat. So it's in these three buckets that a project was launched many years ago. It was launched by a Heisuk person himself, actually the older brother to Jess Housty, William Housty. You see an inset image here. This is where William and his crew of the Cux Project Society, a nonprofit in Bella Bella, started a grizzly bear monitoring program in a very important ecologically, culturally uh, watershed uh, in the territory referred to as the Quay. From that time in 2006, 2007, into the 2010s, and still to this day, the project has grown into what we refer to as an international bear monitoring project. And what we mean by that is involves the First Nations, their governments, their communities across five different nations from the Wikinu of, of the sort of southeastern portion of that uh, polygon there, the New Hall, kind of Bella, uh, Bella Kula, rather, the Heltzik, kind of in the middle, to the north, going northwest, the Kitasu Heihe's out of Clem Tu, and the Git Gap, finally, to the northwest, out of Hartley Bay and beyond. So at its peak, when all nations were involved in the work. Some have, have gone on to other things, but at the peak, this work covered about 22,000 square kilometers, about the size of El Salvador. And the kind of questions and opportunities and problems that this project confronted were both of interest to the local governments, the sovereign self-determining governments in this region of the world, and also projects that span the interest of these neighbors and allies up and down the coast. And not only questions were asked about grizzly bears, but also black bears, which included the very beautiful white bear. Not sure if this will work in this format. We'll give it a shot. This is, yeah, great. I think this works. This is an example of a culturally relevant method that reflects the relationship that the researchers from the communities have with these bears instead of capturing bears and taking blood and teeth and, and other samples from an anesthetized bear and subjecting it to a radio collar and other forms of, of um, stress. This instead is luring a bear to a non-reward site, a non-reward bait is poured that 
is liquid, the bear can't consume it. And here she steps over, you may have noticed in the, in the background there, it's hopping up and down. That's a little bit of barbed wire that doesn't hurt a bear, especially in the spring with a really thick coat. And here she comes over, uh, <clears throat> the, the barbed wire leaves a bit of hair, and here she is on her way literally within an average of about two minutes. This one's a bit of a monkey, uh, this grizzly bear. Um, uh, in doing so, it leaves a hair sample. And this is like a gateway, if you will, to a whole bunch of information about that animal, what species it is, what sex it is, what individual identity it is from the molecules that come from the food of the bear and grow, gets incorporated into the hair of the bear. We can tell, for example, what proportion of each individual's diet was comprised of salmon in the previous year. We have insight into the stress level of this animal. We're counting individuals over space and time, which gives us an idea of how populations can grow and shrink over time and how that may relate to other environmental correlates and especially what humans might do to their environment in, in catalyzing such changes. Before I go too much further, I want to point out some really important people in this project. Yes, it's done out of a university lab in part, but in, in larger part, there's people like William that I've already mentioned, Jason and Megan Moody from the New Hulk, um, <clears throat> Jennifer Walkus from the We Canoe, Doug Nieslaus from the Kittisu Hey Hey, and others that have done and continue to do tremendous work despite working on many other files from their nations. So let's give you a quick example of the type of questions we ask about food and in particular about salmon. Little setup here, we know then when bears exist with more salmon, they tend to be bigger, they tend to have more babies, and they tend to occur at higher densities. These are all good things for bear populations, so having more salmon is a good thing. Let's go to a, a problem or maybe an opportunity if we put on rose-colored glasses in the wee canoe, formerly called Rivers Inlet Sockeye System, one of the biggest sockeye systems in the world historically, the third biggest producer in BC, um, until the uh, industrial fisher showed up and habitat destruction brought in by outsiders logging wee canoe forests, outsiders robbing the wee canoe of their sockeye populations, such that in 1999, a population that at one time, before this graph was even relevant, hundreds of years ago, might have been in the order of several million fish, maybe up to 10 million fish. There was 2,000 sockeye returned in 1999, and that year, many, many grizzly bears perished in the village of Wikinu, which set in motion uh, and elevated uh, the, the kind of response and planning that the Wikinu would do to ensure this never happens again to their bears, their, rel their relatives. So one project was launched as the sockeye population started to increase and the commercial fishers, the outsiders, are knocking on the door of the federal government to be let back into this system. The system has been closed to the commercial fisheries since 1999. The Wikinu are saying, we're now in the driver's seat and we now have both um, the authority, we've never lost it, but we are exercising our authority again to manage the sockeye system. And now we have data like never before to combine with our own knowledge and our own values. I don't expect everyone to <clears throat> understand this graph, but I want you to take away um, uh, the following. The we canoe have, have uh, studied salmon for a very long time and studied the relationship between how many come back to spawn in one year and how many of the next generation come back. So we get a relationship between fisheries yield on that vertical axis and the number of salmon that are allowed to escape, that is escape nets and go up the, up the creeks. That's the hump shape um, curve that you see under regular fisheries management that optimizes only the allocation of salmon to people, 
the escapement would be set right below the height of that curve. I'm not sure if you could see my cursor there, but the Wikanu uniquely are considering the lives of bears and allocating more salmon to that ecosystem so that bear densities, not the hump shape, but that, that curve that steadily goes up, bear densities go up when there is greater salmon escapement. And what they have done, guided by a local Wikinu value, uh, Nanakila, to watch over someone and look ahead for them, looking out for these bears. They have devised a policy target to allocate much more salmon for the bears, even if that comes at some cost to human fisheries yield. It's a way of, of sharing with the ecosystem, sharing with their relatives, and a beautiful example of that. And there are now reconciliation frameworks uh, whereby this research can be translated into action. Let's talk about the bear hunt. Uh, sorry, I should have given a trigger warning. This is thankfully over on the coast, and I want to tell you why it is over. It's not over because scientists said it was a dangerous thing to do. We we have done that as a team, but it is over because Coastal First Nations uh, um, did some incredible campaigning work, um, uh, declared Indigenous law uh, that forbid such activity of outsiders. Yes, some of the science was very important to show at a provincial scale scale science that, that our team conducted that indeed too many bears die, even compared to the own limits that the provincial government has set. This was influential in terms of driving media attention. It was discussed uh, two legislative sessions uh, back in the year in which was published clearly important. <clears throat> But even in the province's own declarations, they didn't stop this hunt because uh, there was a scientific concern in their eyes. They recognized that the behavior did not align with the value systems of most British Columbians. And a lot of people stood back and reflected on those values after hearing from the campaigns by coastal First Nations and others. So a real reminder that the type of values and relationships embedded in those values are very important to consider in the, the stewardship, <clears throat> excuse me, of natural resources. And finally, here's an example from further up coast from the Kittisu Heihe's. What we did with this team is sample a giant landscape actually across several of, of the territories here and identified what regions um, had the hot spots of the version of the gene that codes for the white bear. So the hotter the red, the higher proportion of genes in the environment code for that white fur. You're also seeing these hashed um, polygons. Those are parks and protected areas. So the purpose of this project was to identify areas outside of those established protected areas that had high frequencies of the white bears. This information identifies candidate uh, areas for new forms of protection, not protection that would come from the provincial government, but protections that the Kitasu Heihe's and, and their neighbors are uniquely considering for them, themselves and their own landscape um, planning in the form of potential Indigenous conserved and protected areas informed by this on the ground uh, research. Just a final thing as a reflection on relationships between people and animal. We've talked about the idea of, of local nations considering these animals as ancestors. Um, here's another vantage on, on some of these relationships, and it comes from some genomics work that a graduate student, uh, Raincoast uh, biologist Dr. Lauren Henson, did. We expected grizzly bears in the area to kind of look the same genetically. To our surprise, we found three very distinct groups genetically of grizzly bears on the coast. And we um, came to understand that the boundaries to these genetic groups among these three uh, kind of relative population of bears landed 
almost perfectly on the boundaries that that separated indigenous language family groups on the coast. This gives us some insight into the close and similar connections that grizzly bears and humans of the area have had with this landscape over deep time in that both humans and bears have been shaped either culturally or genetically in very similar spatial patterns over time. Another reminder of, of how close our relationships are with the animals on the coast. So with that, uh, I bring you back to this uh, original image and idea I shared with you, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Chris. That was so amazing. I think we did a disservice to all our people in the audience by making this such a short presentation. I'm sure everybody there is clamoring for more, but short. Um, I'll ask one question at this point. I, I must admit, uh, we we had a sneaky reason for doing these, these series of seminars. We want to probe our special panelists to find out what lessons they've learned from their work that we can apply in this area. So for example, I'm trying to figure out what can we do? What, what is some of the work that was done by your lab that can help the CRD to share our lands with the large relatives we have here, with our cougars, our black bears, and wolves? What are some potential actions that we can take here? Hmm. Uh, I would say things that have been really useful for us is to invest uh, for a long-term project. These are long-lived animals. Uh, they're elusive. Uh, it takes a long time to learn just a little bit about them. And so investing in longer term projects at large spatial scales, working with local people in real authentic, productive ways, understanding that the future of these systems in the CRD and beyond are part ecological. Um, but in many parts, social and cultural, in that the, the more we understand uh, how human decision making can predict the outcomes for, for these important animals, um, the better. The more detail we understand about those relationships, some of the policy levers, be they territorial, indigenous, policies, prescriptions, stewardship ideas uh, to provincial or, or municipal CRD type policy procedures. Understanding that policy landscape is also really, really important. Thank you, Chris. We really appreciate you taking the time and being with us here today. My pleasure. Thanks to all. Okay, I think we'll move on to our second presenter. Our second presenter is Chelsea Greer. Chelsea is an emerging conservation scientist with an interest in animal ethics and coexistence. She currently coordinates Raincoast Conservation Foundation's Wolf Conservation Program. This initiative works towards shifting the provincial management of gray wolves away from a poorly informed and exploitation-based model to one that respects the welfare of wolves and their important role in functioning ecosystems. Chelsea holds a master's in, in geography from the University of Calgary where she studied the behavioral ecology of reintroduced elephants. She also has a BSc in applied animal biology from the University of BC, which focused on the role of and ethics around animals in human society. Welcome, Chelsea. Thank you, Nithya. Okay, well, hello everyone. I'm really excited to be here with all of you today in this virtual space. Um, I am presenting today from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish um, peoples, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. So for those of you that are not familiar with Rain Coast, um, we are a team of conservationists and scientists empowered by our research to protect the lands waters and wildlife of coastal British Columbia. Our mandate is to investigate, inform and inspire. And our vision for coastal BC is to protect the habitats and resources of umbrella species. And we believe that this approach will help safeguard all species, including people and ecological processes that exist at different scales. Central to our efforts are long-term partnerships with indigenous governments. 
And as you heard in my bio, I currently coordinate Raincoast Wolf Conservation Program. Um, and it is through this program that we are currently working to shift the provincial management of gray wolves away from a poorly informed and exploitation-based model to one that respects the welfare of wolves, as well as their important role in functioning ecosystems. So our policy recommendations, as well as our advocacy on behalf of wolves, are grounded in rigorous peer-reviewed science and conservation ethics. Our ultimate goal is to end the killing of wolves in BC for purpose of predator control, trophies, and perceived competition for shared prey. Now, I want to start by talking about the a little bit about the human human dimensions of wildlife conflict, and then I'll go over um, the current management practices regarding wolves in BC. And then I want to end the talk by talking a little bit about the important ecological role that wolves play from disease management all the way to e ecosystem carbon cycling. So human wildlife conflict occurs when an action by either humans or wildlife has an adverse effect on the other. However, this term is problematic um, as it does suggest that wildlife are conscious human an antagonists. So researchers like Redpath et al. 2012 partition such conflicts into their two components. One being the impacts that deal with the direct interactions be between humans and other species and two, the conflicts that center on human interactions between those seeking to conserve species and those with other goals. It may be surprising to hear that the conflict between people about gray wolves is much more common than direct interactions between people and wolves. And the distinction between the two components is important because they are managed very differently. Impacts of human wildlife interactions can be resolved through legislation, mitigation, or technical solutions, while human-human conflicts that arise from negative interactions about wolves can be harmful to relationships between those people and overall much more challenging to resolve. The diversity in human attitudes gives rise to multiple and conflicting priorities and goals regarding the presence of carnivores in shared landscapes. And these interactions are often about influencing how others think about wolves or having the power to make decisions about wolves. The issues related to the conservation and welfare of these animals in many ways is perpetuated by the categories and labels humans have imposed upon them. So BC's wolves have been labeled as overabundant or nuisance wildlife, ultimately leading to them to be the target of government sanctioned wolf calls and gratuitous trophy hunts, which I will go into a little bit more detail about that shortly. So when labels are removed though, it is revealed that our actions, i.e. our treatment of wildlife, are a product of our attitudes towards wildlife, not an inherent quality of the animals themselves. So systems in which humans and carnivores share space are characterized by high mortality of carnivores, threats to human safety, economic loss, and political conflicts. North American wildlife policies are still rooted in a model that seeks to eradicate wolves and other large carnivores or to tolerate them only at levels below their ecological effectiveness. And BC is no exception. Wolves in this province can be killed through legal activities of hunting and trapping that include many gratuitous, inhumane and unethical methods. In 2015, the BC government started killing wolves in the habitat of endangered caribou. And to date, over 1,700 wolves have been trapped, hunted, or shot from low-flying aircrafts under the guise of caribou recovery. Hundreds more are killed um, for the protection of domestic livestock. Between 2016 and 2020, 684 wolves were trapped and killed through the BC Cattlemen's Association's Livestock Protection Program. And while lethal control may provide temporary relief for caribou or domestic livestock, it opens up the vacant territory for colonization by a new pack. And wolves make up populations that are extremely resilient. So unless the root cause is addressed, the cycle of loss continues with more and more um, money being spent. And above all, the methods of capture employed in these lethal programs are unethical and inhumane, causing targeted individuals intense pain and suffering. So the BC government estimates that, um, sorry, 
I'm just going to go back here. Um, the wolves are not only controlled by management authorities, um, but also through the actions of individual citizens in regions where livestock production or big game hunting is valued. Um, so the BC government estimates that um, some 1,200 wolves are killed annually for recreational purposes. And when I say recreational in this context, I mean to kill a wolf for the purpose of sport, trophy, or perceived competition for shared prey, i.e. valued game species like elk or deer. And Raincoast large carnivore experts suspect that this number is likely higher um, given, to be, given um, BC's weak reporting requirements as well as inadequate conservation enforcement capability. And to that point, BC's hunting and trapping regulations are extremely lax. There are no quotas, no specific tag required. In fact, wolves are the only big game species that does not require a resident hunter to purchase a specific tag. And there is no mandatory, mandatory reporting in the majority of regions. Vancouver Island and the lower mainland are the only regions that have a compulsory reporting program. So in many regions in BC, there is no limit to the number of wolves that can be killed daily. Hunting season is often open from September to June and can include periods from April to May when wolves, um, den and pups are born. And I think it's also important to note that the government encourages hunters and trappers to kill these animals. For hunting, there are no bag limits in management units that are adjacent to caribou habitat and where livestock protection is deemed an issue. And wolves are also designated as a class three species. So in trapping regulations, it specifically states that trappers will be encouraged to trap these species, especially in areas of chronic animal damage control problems. And it should also be noted that it is lawful to bait a wolf when engaging in hunting and trapping. Now, what happens when an apex predator like the wolf is removed from an ecosystem? Wolves have a lot of important ecological roles, so environments without them can suffer from severe ecological imbalances and environmental impoverishment. So for one, wolves feed other species. Um, research from North the Northern Rockies has shown that no other predator feeds as many species as wolves do. And the remaining carcasses often feed many other scavengers, including ravens, owls, magpies, eagle, wolverine, cougar, grizzly bear, and so many other species. And wolves also help to keep prey populations healthy. Often they'll target the young, the sick, the old individuals, and that can have consequences in maintaining a healthy balance between predator and prey. So not having too many prey helps keep the natural balance of ecosystems, and that's really important. And through this selective predation, Wolves can play an important role in controlling diseases like bovine tuberculosis or chronic wasting disease. And the risk of disease transmission also directly affects some farmers near protected wildlife areas as concerns have been growing regarding the spread of bovine tuberculosis from wildlife to domestic cattle. So by taking out the sick individuals, wolves might be helping to keep the prey populations healthier. So that might have implications in terms of disease management and trying to keep diseases from spreading too much in the prey populations and also spreading to domestic cattle. And there are also what some people call non-consumptive effects. So wolves have an impact directly by eating prey, but then they also have a whole other suite of different effects on ecosystems just by being present. They can influence the behavior of prey species because those prey are scared of wolves, so they might use different habitats than they would if there was no wolves on the landscape. And a great example of this is what we saw in Yellowstone National Park, where the reintroduction of wolves set off a cascade of changes that restored the park's habitat. Um, and this is what this image here represents. So we saw elk populations decrease and their behavior also changed preventing overgrazing of different tree species like aspens and willows. This restored nesting space for birds and provided shade along rivers and streams, making habitat better for fish and other aquatic species. And wolves can also have cascading impacts on ecosystem carbon cycling. So when research researchers scaled up wolf impacts to the broader North American boreal and grassland wolf range, their estimates suggested a potential for the indirect effects of wolves on yearly carbon fluxes to be on the same order 
of magnitude as the fossil fuel emissions of six to 20 million cars per year. And research has shown that changes in animal abundance can cause major shifts in capacity of ecosystems to store or exchange carbon. And the impact of wild animals on the carbon cycle is becoming more relevant as researchers and poly policymakers consider the use of natural ecological processes to recapture and store atmospheric carbon within ecosystems as a tool to tackle climate change. So wolves and other carnivores are important for more than just their ecological value, however. however. Um, for many people, wolves represent strong cultural and aesthetic values, and the importance of these values appears to be increasing. Strong values, um, the strong values large carnivores invoke um, lead to substantial economic value as more people spend more money to see carnivores in the wild. And to put it simply, large carnivores matter to a vast growing number of people. So the question is not whether killing wolves is sustainable as many wildlife managers will try to assert. The question is whether it's ecologically or ethically defensible to kill large numbers of predators anywhere. And science and ethics would agree that the answer on all counts is no. As you now know, wolves play an extremely important ecological role as apex predators and hunting and trapping causes significant harm and distress, both for wolves that die as a result and those that survive. Heavily hunted wolves have higher stress levels than wolves with lower hunting pressure, and the adverse impact may be multi-generational. From our perspective, there is no ethical justification for imposing such harm and suffering. In Aldo Leopold's final book, he writes that land as a community is the basic concept of ecology but that land is to be loved and respected is an extension of ethics. We must work towards the implementation of policy that respects the welfare of wolves and their ecological role and wolves deserve our protection. Thank you so much for listening. And I just wanna say if any viewers have questions that we don't get to today, please do not hesitate to contact me at the email you see on this slide. Um, I've also included various links if you're interested in supporting our work or learning more about wolves. And if you're on Twitter, follow Raincoast and myself to get um, continuous updates on our work. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, it's really good to hear the whole perspective on, on wolves and, and especially now that we're seeing wolves coming into some areas that we haven't seen in a long time. For example, in Souk, East Souk and Machosan here on the island, um, it's good to hear about your work. I, I've got a question. And now that we're seeing a wolf, wolves in, in the southern part of Vancouver Island, what do you recommend that we start to put in place to avoid conflict um, and, and to avoid conflict from escalating and to try and promote coexistence with the wolves in these areas? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think education is really key um, just really empowering community members with information that's going to allow them to coexist. You know, for example, you know, if wolves are um, in the breeding season, denning, they have pups around, you know, they're going to be more defensive of their territory. And just having people understand that behavior, for example, and, you know, understanding how important it is to keep their dogs on a leash, um, maybe avoid those areas can be a great kind of step to empower people to understand the behavior and not necessarily be, I guess, um, intimidated or fearful that they are sharing a landscape with wolves. Because I think a lot of that um, fear and uncertainty comes from just that, a novel experience sharing um, the landscape with wolves. Um, so education, as well as, you know, what Chris was saying, long-term monitoring and understanding um, the ecology of these wolves and their behavior and what they need um, sharing a landscape with humans. Thanks, Chelsea. It's, uh, it's so good to have you here. Thank you for the important work that you're doing. Thank you. Okay, so now we go to our third presenter. Giselle Maria Martin is from the house of Cloquet First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Giselle is a cultural lifeways, indigenous language and tribal parks guardian, an educator, outdoor guide, Nichalnet canoe captain, photographer and artist. 
Giselle continues lifelong learning and traditional work of their family to uphold intergenerational ecological responsibilities for the continued protection of future generations of life. Welcome, Giselle. Um, I come from the house of Ihoset from Tlaogwet First Nation, which is one of the New Channels nations on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And I'm here at home today, right now, in the Hahuthi of the Tlaogwet Hatwe. Our territory, the Hahuthi, Hahuthi is a word that's often translated as a chief's traditional territory. But it is the living spirit of a place also. It is the spirit of a place and all of its biodiversity. It includes the songs, the names, the dances from that place and the intergenerational relationship and responsibilities that we carry with those places. One of the most important laws that we have um, that I've been taught is ESOC, which is um, often translated as meaning respect, but it can be translated many ways. ESOC is to observe, to appreciate, and to act accordingly, those three things together. And when we observe, it's not about just taking data or listening with our ears, but listening with our whole being, listening with our guts, our intuition, and our hearts. And I believe that is how our language came here. We listen with our whole being to the life around us. Tlaokwe language, Newtonal's languages are of the land. They are of these places. And the sounds in the suffixes of the words, they are made up of the sounds that are made by the animals and the birds and the trees and the water. Um, so really, this land has educated and created us. And the animals that are out here, like the bears and the wolves, um, the deer, the cougars that you're speaking about, um, they don't, they aren't here just as um, something for us to objectify or use. They, they educate us about who we are and about life teachings. And they are our relatives. In English language, there's a really heavy hierarchy. There's an objectification and othering of nature and of the environment, um, even human supremacy. And our, you know, the language that we speak now, English is really riddled with it. There's the hierarchy of he, she, and it. And most people, we get to go by he, she, or sometimes they now. Um, people's cats and dogs that are close to us might get upgraded to a he or a she, but most animals become it, they are it. And so with that hierarchy, you know, often people's pets and dogs will get to have this privilege of chasing all the animals off of a beach while the seagulls and the birds are trying to feed. And that hierarchy is really damaging. There is no hierarchy of he, she, and it in Tlaokwet language. The suffix that we have, or the um, the pronoun that we have is ish, which is all they, they, it's a singular they. So the tree is an individual, the rock is an individual, even the plants are individuals, the bear is an individual. So even in English, as I've been learning language for the last um, 12 years now, and Thinking about these things, when I see bears, um, when I think about wolves or cougars, I try my best to take out that language of it and othering and refer to them as they, as they are in our own language. Um, in our own histories and stories, uh, you know, we came to this place in a magical way and we've been adopted by the family of life that is here we were given all of the material things that we need to survive as humans we are born pretty naked we don't have the blubber of a whale we don't have the fur of a sea otter we don't have the fur of a bear um, we don't have the tools that we need we don't have sharp claws to dig we don't have sharp teeth to bite uh, 
you know, we need a lot of things to supplement our existence. And the plants and the animals as our relatives donated many of these things. But they didn't just donate material goods or food for us to eat. They have taught us how to live in these places. And they continue to share those teachings when we listen and practice ESOC, the law to observe, appreciate, and act accordingly. The names of the animals are something really precious to me, like Kwayatsik wolf is uh, the name for Kwayatsik. Uh, but it doesn't mean just wolf as a noun. It is the verb of what they do. So it's connected to our word for what we say, Kwatsamis. Kwatsamis is responsibility or the things that we need to do to make things right in this world. Kwatsamis or kwa e be like that, you know, uphold your roles and responsibilities. And that is directly in the name of the wolf in our language. Chim's bear is another one. Um, Chim's is connected to the ideas around boundaries and respecting other people's boundaries. Um, Chim akt is to be happy. Chim's chi us is to be comfortable. Chim's almost just sounds like to be happy, to be really happy on the land. But it's, you know, what do we need to be happy and comfortable? We need to have strong boundaries. And that's connected to the sound that bears make when they communicate with one another about their boundaries by clicking their teeth. Um, Sijpach, cougar, I don't know the hidden meanings within the name of Sijpach or Kayumin as some call them. Uh, but there are many teachings about preparation. Um, you know, we don't just throw ourselves into a, a hastily made plan. Um, we research and we execute things really carefully and we watch everything before we do those important things. And that's one of the teachings of Cougar. And I think it's really important right now that we listen and watch and learn from the land as we are facing some really big challenges in the world to do with pollution and climate change, especially. Um, Muwach is deer, and I don't know also what the name Muwach has inside of it, but when I think of deer, I think about the dignity that animals have and the rights to dignity that they were respected for on most of this continent where animals were not forced into becoming our slaves. They were not um, kept in enclosures or farmed or bred like livestock. They have their own dignity and they have their own knowledge about where to go, what medicines to eat in the forest. And that is their private knowledge, though we can access it by eating them sometimes. And when things are in balance like that, then we can avoid creating uh, terrible diseases that have come out of you know, the enslavement of animals, um, tuberculosis, smallpox, even COVID-19, a lot of these things have come out of the abuse of animals that are forced into unnatural situations. And then that spread to us. So there were barely any diseases. There was no diseases here before colonization in our home and these lands and waters, um, they are still often referred to as wilderness by newcomers. A wilderness is an English term, and I understand there's a romance attached to it, but there is no word for wilderness in our own language. The closest translation that we have to the word wilderness is wath you, and that means home. And all of the parts of our home were taken care of by our families and our nations that have lived here since before time immemorial. Um, I do want to say, you know, that humans overall are not bad. There's many references to humans and often humans, when people talk about humans, there's this assumption that the default human is colonial society and it isn't. Um, Humans have lived here for many, many, many generations, and we have lived in good relationship 
with the lands and the biological life force around us, the bears, the wolves. And so we have a lot of protocols and laws and even what we could translate as treaties with these beings as we move around and do what we need to do on the lands and the waters. Um, bears, you know, we need to give them a lot of space. And when we go berry picking, we don't ever strip all of the berries off of a berry, of a berry bush. We leave some for the birds and the bears. They not only need those spaces, but they also contribute to the health of them. With wolves, we give them the right of way. And here where I live, it is against our laws to ever harm a wolf or kill a wolf. It is totally unlawful to kill a wolf. And um, you know, it, it really saddens me to hear of these atrocious laws that have been put in place by the short-term colonial government here. Um, Yeah, so humans, humans overall, you know, I, I used to buy into the idea that humans overall are bad and we're destroying nature and whatnot. Um, but I went to a conference in Spain years ago where I got to speak about wilderness. I ended up on a panel with nine Indigenous men and I went there to say there's no word for wilderness in our language. The closest word we have is with you meaning home, and then speak about how we take care of that home. And to my delight, every person on that panel, and there was a tribal herdsman from the Sahara, there was somebody from Hawaii, there was somebody from China, an indigenous person from China, and each of them said the same thing, but in their own words. There is no wilderness, it's home. And so again, I just want to assert that the colonial society, especially white colonial society, are not the default humans. And um, you know, human laws are very diverse. And the old human laws that have been in place here are still in place. They're still being upheld by our families, by our nations as much as we can. And part of that is the practice of our language. And I'm really stoked. I'm really happy about um, the resurgence in our languages because it helps to change how we frame the world, how we think about it, and how we are in relationship with it. There is no sustainability in our language. We practiced abundability. And when we can aim for that, and when we can share that with newcomers, um, I think, you know, we'll be able to heal a lot of our relationships with the plants and the animals. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Giselle. Um, that was amazing. It, uh, your, your talk reaches a truth that's deep within all our spirits. And it's really good to have you say that to us. Uh, like, I guess my question is, and especially listening to what you were saying about language and how it establishes relationships with everything out there, how how do we approach this barrier that we have with the English and other colonial languages which don't have those relationships embedded in the words? How do we, what do we do with that? How do we approach that? How do we approach that barrier? I don't know. That's a good question. I know with language work where we signage and make versions of interpretive panels say about whale hunting in English, French, and New Channel. Um, they were designed in English first and then translated into New Channel. When I was beginning to learn, I went to read those panels and I knew just enough to read the new channels and so I read it to see if I could understand what they were saying without reading the English and it sounded to me like a whale being is so giving and full of gifts many many gifts to the people I was like okay great I think I understand and then I looked at the English and it said new channels people hunted and killed the whales and used the blubber meat and bones and I was like, that's not what we said at all. And there's just many concepts that are in indigenous languages 
that are hard to translate or you need an entire thesis to translate. And there's many words used in English. So I think it's really important that we support indigenous languages as much as we can wherever we are and um, work on upholding those for now. And hopefully then more borrowed words can come into the English language, just like the words for cuisine. That sounds like an amazing, sounds like a, sounds like a very worthwhile project. Thank you. I think we're going to bring everybody on for questions, Shauna. Is that the plan? That's great. Okay, we have a couple of we have time for a couple of questions anyway. So I think the first thing I'd like to ask everybody is this whole ecology of fear. So especially when you look at the large carn carnivores, fear raises its head. So maybe we can um, talk about how do we deal with that? How do we manage that? And how do we cope with that? Chris? Sure, uh, I could start. Um, yeah, certainly uh, prey animals have evolved um, this amazing ability to stay safe. That has been um, shaped in how they behave uh, for millennia, and it can have real consequences for the ecosystem in terms of when and where they occur as prey animals and what they may do to the vegetation in both good ways and 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 others um, and something relevant here is that as as humans even um, seemingly benign things that we do Giselle um, brought up a good scenario with our dogs which are essentially, um, you know, extensions of ourselves are interpreted as bona fide predators by things like the gulls and and shorebirds, <clears throat> and sets in motion potentially a cascade of reactions among these other animals that can then cascade into their food systems, etc. Um, so it's more complex than just understanding how our behaviors may affect the numbers of species. It's uh, how they may affect the behavior of species and how those behaviors can cascade across food webs. So it's much more complicated stuff, harder to approach. Uh, typical Western uh, scientific management doesn't often manage for those sort of um, things, but, um, they ought to um, if we if we care about these sort of consequences. Um, anyways, with, with that, I will uh, pass it on to my colleagues here. Thanks, Chris. Chelsea or Giselle? Yeah, I mean, when you talked about landscape of fear, I wasn't necessarily sure if you were refer referring to, you know, the fear that people have with wolves. And I think that's where the, the education comes in about wolf ecology and behavior, um, as well as, you know, we talk about like the conflict between, or the interact negative re interactions that can happen between wolves and humans, but then also between humans and humans. And I think um, facilitating a dialogue can be really important in this issue as well. And um, getting, you know, diverse perspectives together to, um, to converse and really, try and tackle these issues together by kind of, you know, looking at what we value because, you know, values, like Chris had said, you know, it's not just the science that, that drives management practices, but it, what is important is the values of society. And so I think getting people together and still having conversations about it instead of kind of letting it um, unravel and having these very polarizing um, and I mean, wolves art can be very polarizing, but I think bridging people together to talk about it and collaborate together. Um, and that's where indigenous collaboration is so important as well, um, can kind of help work towards um, moving away from that fear, I guess. Thanks, uh, Chelsea. I think you, you made a nice bridge between the, the fear between predator prey to the human aspect. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to Giselle about. How do you, how do we bring that, um, how do we manage that aspect of fear in people from these large animals, the cougars, your bears and, and wolves? How do we manage that? 
you asking me now? Mm -hmm. Just ask. Um, I think, well, the fear of animals, of the animals that are out there doing what they've always done is really parallel with racism. The spe it's really a form of, it's a species speciesism that is parallel with racism. And, you know, many, there's animals out there that people know a lot more and they're more familiar with, like say, for instance, dogs. You know, how many people get bit by dogs every year? People get killed by dogs. And yet most people love dogs and they're all over Instagram. They're all over Facebook. There's pet and grooming services everywhere for them. Um, so to me, it's really speciesism. And part of, um, I think, the depression, international global depression that's happening right now is a removal from the family of life that we are part of. You know, studies show that we're more happy when we have a larger social network. And for me, part of my social network are the birds that I see, the bears that are around. Even if I'm not running up and getting in their space, it makes me happy that they're there. And I think part of the fear, addressing the fear, will need to be education. And people need to learn that all of these different species have their own languages. They have their own body languages as well. We can learn... Um, we can learn those languages. Like most children, they're so familiar with dogs. They know when a dog's wagging their tail that they're maybe happy. And they know when they're putting their teeth out, they're not. We know if a cat is wagging their tail, they're not happy. And bears have those languages too. You know, bears, if you get too close to a bear, often they'll just be like nodding their head back and forth. And you see this with people approaching bears much too closely on the side of the highway. The bear is nodding their head back and forth. And they're basically saying like, okay, we need to get away from each other. I don't know which way you want to go. Show me which way you want to go and I'll go the opposite way. You know, they're actually being really polite and people are oblivious to this and they're getting way in their space. And it's not until they get really like clear teeth warnings that maybe they'll back off. Um, but overall, bears, wolves, cougars, all of the animals that we live out here with, they are very, very respectful, amazing beings. And they have incredible strength and teachings to give us. So I think that public education is really important. Thanks, Giselle. That's, that's really good to hear that. Uh, I'm going to bring this back again to the Capital Regional District. And I want to figure out how we can do some work in an area where we have a strong urban space. So both in Victoria and Vancouver, we have a huge urban area and right against it is the wildlife refuge for cougars and bears and wolves. So what can be done to try and enhance these large carnivore populations where we have humans, we have dense populations of humans right next to them. And I'm just wondering what can be done and uh, you know, can you just maybe talk about that a little bit? wants to go first. Giselle, you want to start? Uh, propagate indigenous plants. Take care of indigenous plants and gardens, ancestral gardens. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Chelsea or Chris? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think just, I feel like I keep bringing it back to the education of, you know, how do we coexist with these, these animals and um, I think having this kind of co-adaptation and tolerance level of these animals is kind of a great way to, to increase abundance and biodiversity by, you know, making these areas places that people want to visit, people want to protect. Um, and, you know, having guardians protect the land as well. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, there's great opportunity with, um, with kind of reaching out to the public and you know having them understand kind of what's what's going on, um, and you know having that kind of community-based solutions that we can all collaborate among each other to kind of um, keep this ecosystem healthy. Thanks, Chelsea. Chris, any words on that? Uh, yeah, uh, the constraints aren't really um, in terms of habitat or prey, or certainly not prey. There's prey abounding 
in in large part because we haven't seen these large carnivores in any ecologically relevant numbers for quite some time uh, since probably since the the ravages of of colonization um, and so uh, Chelsea mentioned tolerance that's what this will th that's what will be the central um, factor in determining what the future looks like uh, in terms of the distribution and abundance of, of carnivores. Uh, it will be uh, in the realm of society and, and culture and not so much ecology. Uh, um, and I guess along those veins, you know, listening to the, the local title holders and getting a, a feeling as to their vision for what sort of landscape uh, they want their territory to support vis-a-vis -vis carnivores in in the the near and long term. Um, I think that's the the secret sauce for for success going forward. That sounds really good. Um, for for our audience, I know we're just past one o'clock, but the discussion is so good that I hate to stop. I think we'll take one more question and then we will finish this off. So um, okay, so the question is, often economic growth is the greatest political motivator. What economic opportunities exist in better protecting habitat for large carnivores like bears and wolves and cougars? Chelsea, why don't we start with you this time? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge economic value to protecting wolves and bears and other large carnivores. Um, you see that in the Great Bear Rainforest. I'm sure Chris can talk a little bit more to that. Um, and just preserving those areas um, is kind of feeding this economic model of ecotourism um, and empowering, you know, the indigenous nations in those areas um, to, you know, have a sustainable lifestyle, um, protecting these this wild these wildlife as well. Um, and when I think about economics as well, you know, there are economic benefits um, to having wolves on the landscape besides ecotourism, you know, the way that they impact their prey populations and the movements of prey. Um, there's a recent study that came out that talks about, you know, wolves will use man-made roads, highways that, um, and because they're kind of creating this landscape of fear for their prey, deer populations aren't crossing those roads as much. And so there's a huge economic impact um, with deer car collisions and, you know, saving human lives. Um, so I think there's, and that research is continuing and there's a lot more to learn um, about the economic impacts, but those are just a couple, couple things. Fantastic. Giselle or Chris, anything to add to that? Yeah. Um... There is this misconception that First Nation people and Native American people just hunted and gathered all across this continent or that we just survived in the little territories that we're from. But we've had incredible trade networks all across the continent for thousands of years. We've traded items that are vital to our survival and to our thriving. And those, those economies have been in place for a really, really long time. They've been heavily disrupted. Um, for example, like the potlatch, which was uh, made illegal by the Canadian government for over 60 years. But that is an economic system where we would pay things forward. It was a gift giving economic system, which heavily, heavily respected the animals. And we were very wealthy because of the way that we lived like that. Um, so capitalism is not working and capitalism is not the only model for the economy and it needs to change. So, you know, when, when we include living respectfully with these large beings, I think it'll make all of us more healthy. Fantastic. Chris, do you want to finish off? This question? Just to um, <clears throat> compliment both with an I and an E what, what Giselle just said. Um, it, it was uh, a really beautiful reminder about the different ways we can think about economies. We have two examples too, and about valuing things and nature. And I just maybe the last thing I'll say is that there is inherent value, not necessarily uh, other forms of value, but there is inherent value to 
uh, living in an ecosystem that has animals like that, that is healthy enough to support animals. And, and that sort of uh, inherent value, I think, and I think most people agree, is priceless. Absolutely. I think that's why we're all here right now. Okay, I think we'll end that off right now. A big thank you to Dr. Chris Deramont, Chelsea Greer, and Giselle Maria Martin for joining us for this first Project Teach session and sharing your invaluable expertise with us. We are so grateful. Thanks to everyone who has turned into the Tuesday, tuned into the session to learn together. It has been recorded and will be immediately available for sharing. So we encourage you to send it to anyone you think might benefit from hearing from this incredible panel. But this is not the end. Our next session, Fungi and Plant Diversity, Maintaining Abundance in Coastal Forests, featuring Alan LaRock, Marty Cranenbetter, and Brian Starzmowski, will be at the same time next week, May 19th. Though this session will be recorded, it will not be immediately available for re-watching. This is the next session we're talking about, due to one of our featured scientists sharing results that have not yet been published. So this is a sneak preview. So if you're interested in that session, please try to tune in live. Otherwise, you'll have to wait six to eight weeks to see it. Finally, please consider registering for the in-person solutions session on June 23rd at, at UVic. It will feature an all-star panel and aims to mobilize the lessons learned in these lessons to better inform environmental protection policy in the CRD and other places in BC. We also now have a uh, native plant walk just before we sit down for the solutions. So hopefully we'll see you in all the coming up solutions and on June 23rd. Thank you all. See you next time.